I'm going to ask each of these guys to introduce their experience GMing so that you can get kind of an idea of what they do. I GM mostly teenagers and one adult group uh, at my house uh, twice a week, two games a week usually. And I've written a few modules that are not that great. What <laughs> games? Uh, mostly my homebrew. It's called Mindweave RPG. And that's where you can find the, the content as well. Um, but I also love Planet Mercenary by Howard Taylor. Anybody heard of that one? And I run Hero Kids for my daughters. And I want to run Capers, which is a small one that came out recently, but I haven't found a chance yet. It doesn't use dice. It uses a deck of cards instead. That's cool. Cool. What do you got, William? Um, you guys can call me Will. We're friends now. <laughs> um, so I, I first started GMing probably 23, 24 years ago. I ran D&D, &D and uh, at a little bit later I ran some Earth Dawn, which was kind of cool too. And then I quit playing role-playing games for like 15 years. And I came back to it not too long ago, probably five or six years ago now. It's been a little while. And I have run a lot of different types of games since that time. Uh, a couple of my favorites are The One Ring. If you like Tolkien, The One Ring is a great game. Uh, King Arthur Pendragon is a fantastic game. That's, that's one I really love. Uh, I haven't run D&D &D for a long, long time, uh, I guess. Yeah, but, but I do play it occasionally. Um, cool game. And I like the new edition. And uh, let's see, a lot of Tiny D6. So I play, like with my kids, I play a lot of Tiny D6. So that's just a minimalist one to three D6 game. Really simple. It's a great one if you haven't run a lot of games or if you um, want to get some new people who've never played a role playing game into role playing games. Yeah. I am Natasha Entz. I have been playing RPGs since I was seven years old. My dad started me out on Traveler, and then he got me into Dungeons and Dragons, and I really enjoy Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and I am a full-time pro professional GM. I make my money that way. That is my living. Um, on top of that, I really enjoy Blades in the Dark and then a couple of other ones that he named, and that's why I just kept nodding my head. <laughs> All right, my name is Aaron Lee Yeager, and I am an author. I've been playing Dungeons & Dragons since it first came out. <laughs> and at night, I put on a cape and cowl, and I go out and I fight crime. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I am also a professional dungeon master, not to quite the same extent as her. I kind of stumbled onto it, and some people say, hey, we, we would really love you to DM for us. And I'm like, I'm kind of busy. They're like, we'll pay you. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, we will. So I have two groups going right now. And uh, yeah, and I got, some, I got some of my business cards here. So if you guys want to know more about my books, I have them right there. But for now, Obliviate. <laughs> I'm Dan Wells. I am an author, primarily horror and science fiction. Um, I have a movie, I worked on a TV show, I've also written for stage, uh, won a Hugo Award for a podcast that I do that you've probably never heard of called Writing Excuses. Um, we're recording live tomorrow, by the way, you should all come to it. Uh, I started, anyone my age, anyone with this much gray in their beard, um, got started either on D&D or on Ninja Turtles, and I'm proudly Ninja Turtles. Uh, that's where, that was my introduction to role playing, and I didn't actually try D&D until college. Um, my favorite systems right now, that changes pretty often, uh, Will already mentioned the One Ring and Pendragon, um, which I love. The new edition of Legend of the Five Rings is stellar. And one of my very favorites is actually Fiasco, which I just played earlier. And oh, doesn't I love have that GM, game. So we probably won't talk about it a lot. <laughs> I love that. Fiasco is a really fun it's game. It's so great. It's so much fun. All right. Thanks, guys. So I got some questions here. And I guess we'll do due, 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 due diligence on those before we move on to some other things that we might be more interested in talking about. So how can you maintain an immersive environment for your players? Who wants to talk about what is an immersive environment? Immersive environment. 
That's a tricky one because depending on your group, immersive means different things. Yeah, are we talking about mechanics or are we talking about... Yeah, sometimes okay. immersive is just having Setting? either the GM or that one guy in the group who's like, guys, shut up. You know, and every time they start cracking jokes instead of telling the story, you're like, hey, yeah. focus. Come on, <laughs> pay attention. Uh, and sometimes immersive is all the way, you know, a game like Ten Candles, which is a horror game where the only light source are candles, and as you fail rolls, you blow them out, and when all the candles are out, everyone is dead. <laughs> um, that has an incredible amount of immersion and uh, kind of theme to it, but not every game requires that. Well, and I mean, on top of that, that is a mechanic, right? Yes. And so picking the correct game, the correct mechanic system, right? We were just talking about systems yeah. and how D&D is only one of those systems. Correct, picking the correct system for the game that you want to play is so important because those mechanics speak to your game. Yeah, that is a really good point. Not that Natasha and I are going to monopolize the entire thing. <laughs> Um, but like, take a look at The One Ring by Cubicle 7 and compare that to Adventures in Middle Earth, which is the exact same game by the exact same publisher, but done with the D&D 5e rules. They play wildly differently. They have the same, they're both Lord of the Rings, they're both Middle Earth, but the mechanics promote a very specific tone and play style depending on which one you're doing. Basically what you want to do is play to your table. As the GM, it's your job to be the conductor of an orchestra. And each of the players is going to be part of the music that you will create together. You need to know what kind of music you want to play. Because if one guy wants to play jazz, and one guy wants to play hip hop, and one guy wants to play classical, you're going to end up with avant-garde, which no one likes. <laughs> Some tables want to screw around and have a beer and pretzels game. And that is a perfectly valid way to play. Some people want deep role playing where you are the elf of the Eladrin. Some people want to be the hero. Someone, some people want to just be murder hobos and grind for as much gold as possible. There is no wrong way to play, but you must find out what your players want to play and give them that experience. If they want to be murder hobos, and you want to play a deep, you know, psych psychic, uh, you know, thriller, there's going to be problems at the table. If you, if they want political intrigue, and all you're interested in is having Bolgarth the drunk giant ch trundle after them, there's going to be a problem. So the first thing, very first thing, is find out what your players want and give it to them. Well, and cultivate a table that works together to <laughs> create that, right? You can't necessarily have your murder hobo and then your intrigue at the same table unless you're a really good GM, right? A beginner GM isn't necessarily going to be able to do that. So know yourself as a GM and what you can do. Yeah, I think I can tag on to that just a little bit. I mean, I think that one of the things that you have to do, and you guys touched on this, but you, you, in some ways, I would say rather than, I mean, if you're a pro GM, then you may have to figure out how to work with the group you have or move people around between groups to get, to get the right group. But curating the people who are playing to the type of game that you're playing sometimes can be really beneficial. Like uh, Dan mentioned Fiasco. Fiasco is a fantastic game. And it's really great if you have a bunch of people that want to tell a story that goes tragically wrong together, right? And it's amazing, and I love it. Um, but it is not for everyone, right? Uh, and it can go so wrong if the players are not all together. Right. But not wrong in the right way. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of have to go into that game wanting to lose in a spectacular way. Yeah. If you want to win, the yeah, so is not a great game. You're right. being frustrated. Um, also, there's another type of immersion that, like, I got into a bit of an argument <laughs> with someone online over immersion as in the method actor version of immersion of, like, and this comes from the idea of critical role and everyone's sitting down at a table and, like, let's get deep into our voice acting characters 
and let's put on our costumes or light our candles and um, Sure, you know, awesome. all of that, right? And that's a different type of immersion, and that's not necessarily everyone's type of immersion. And so don't go into D&D thinking, or tabletop gaming, or RPGs, or whatever, <laughs> thinking that you need music and lighting and, you know, sound effects, or all this. <laughs> oh, this is great. Don't mind us, don't mind us. Right. Don't go into this thinking that you need that, right? That's not necessarily what immersion is. If you want that, if that's what your table wants, great, right? Play to your table. That's awesome. But that's a different type of immersion. You can promote immersion in that way. But don't stress yourself out as a GM or as a starting GM if, if, if that's going to stress you out. <laughs> Um, there's a demon from Julie in the uh, <laughs> Dude, I love, I love that some of you got that. I love that some of you got that. <laughs> the candles are so that if any of your parents asked if there was weird stuff that <laughs> you can say yes. Yeah. And we're just going to ignore the demon that's over there now. Just ignoring it. <laughs> so to the point of... Uh, method acting and, and voices. In my experience, most players are not comfortable doing a voice. And yeah. so you shouldn't expect that from your players. If, if that's the type of immersion you're going for, you need a special group. Yeah, you need a right. so, so what I always explain to my new players is there's two, there's two ways we can go about this. And it's fine if you have a mixed group. Is you can either sit, just third person state what your character is doing. My, uh, my elf ranger is going to run up the back of the dragon and try to put two arrows into the back of his head. You can, you can just say what they're doing, or you can play it in character, and in, uh, instead of just saying, oh, my character says this, you can actually do, do the voice and do the accent. Um, generally, people graduate from one to the other. Um, I, uh, like you said, very few people are comfortable doing it in the beginning, uh, but it is really, really fun to do the voices. If you guys have never had a character, like the character I'm playing right now is, uh, is based on Keanu Reeves. He's like a burned out surfer dude. So he's this warlock. He's like, hey, Ross, God. And it's so much fun. And I always say, if you, if you have, tr if, when people do want to graduate to that, just pick your favorite celebrity, you know, and just yeah. do that. Like, like do, do, the, do the Godfather, you know? Just that, have, like, have, like, have like a little goblin merchant who's based on the Godfather. Just like, yeah, I see what you're doing there. That's very nice, but, uh, I don't think this is the proper class for this hour here. And it, it, it's really fun, but it requires a very comfortable situation, and it requires a very non-judgmental table. And so, it, you know, let it happen organically. Do not force it, yeah. or people will feel very uncomfortable. But as a, as a DM, do you do it anyway to help lead them along? Heck yeah! All right. <laughs> yeah. Voices. As, as a Have GM, do it to set an example, but don't expect them to come along. And don't feel that if you are the DM, you have to do the voices. Yeah. You don't. Not everyone is Matt Mercer. Well, and that's situational, too. Like, sometimes I do voices, sometimes I don't. And it depends on the group. And if they want that, sometimes the group doesn't want that. There's a lot you can do with just diction and word choice, how many syllables you use, that doesn't have to involve a goofy accent or anything mm -hmm. like that, too. How fast? Even how just the way that you carry yourself. If, if the character's talking like this versus the character's talking like this, it gives a different feel without having to go over the top. Or using your hands and getting all big with it or being really small. You know, like, that's different. All right, we'll go to the next question. We're trying to figure out our chairs. So, I, everybody else has it figured out. Uh, <laughs> I have mean, you know, chair malfunction over here. So, um, I'm particularly interested in Natasha's answer to this question as a pro. How do you handle on-the-fly adjustments to your story? Sometimes the players don't do what you expected them to do. Things go a little bit crazy. And I know that I have to say, ooh, wait a minute. Uh, I have to go to the bathroom and run off. And I don't know if a pro can do that. 
How do you guys handle on the fly changes to your story? To some extent, handling on the fly changes is your whole job. Yeah. Like yeah. foundationally. Uh, because your job is not to tell your story, your job is to help them tell their story. And so you have a general sense of what's going to happen. The time that it gets really complicated and you don't know what to do is when they actively ruin what you were trying to do. Like if someone comes to a fork in the road and you really need them to go east because there's a castle there, they don't know that, right? No matter which fork in the road they take, they're going to get to the castle you need to get them to. That's yeah. easy. But if, you know, they get to the castle and they're like, you know what, this Dark Lord has some good ideas. Maybe we'll join his army. <laughs> that just changed everything. And that's when you that's when it gets tricky. I, I've had reams of paper of planned material that I just had to throw out. All, all this intrigue of the dwarven court, all, all of the, you know, the the, the love between the prince and the princess of another realm, and all my players did was shop for two whole sessions. <laughs> and they knew there was a time crunch. They knew the marriage takes place on Thursday, or Thursday. And, and, and they're like, no, we're just gonna keep shopping. So I'm like, boom. <laughs> and that's the painful part, and, but it's important to be willing to do that and to work with them, because you're, if, again, you're playing to your table. What your, your, what your audience wants, give it to them. You know, so if they just want to shop, make it a fun shopping experience. You know, make every, have, have people swindle them. Have the shopkeeper uh, be a really memorable NPC character. It's really good to have things just kind of prepared, ready to go. I have a little booklet of just like names. You know, so I'm like, oh, you're gonna see a alchemist. Uh, this is Namor the alchemist. Yes, I have that ready to go. <laughs> but then take notes as you go because sometimes they like those characters and they want to go back. And then you're like, who who is Namor? <laughs> and like, you don't Namor the guy. No, I don't remember that. And so you can never that, get the voice back. And you never you find take that some notes on what the voice was. That's the problem. <laughs> I guess I'm just really stingy. And, and I, was, I thought you were going to disagree. Do you tell them what the story's going to be and they follow a little bit? Or? No. Okay. I'm, I'm just really stingy with how much I plan. Yeah, I think that <laughs> might be smart too if they're going to go off the And list. so I give, I like know my major plot points and I know my major plot points for each character. And so I can scrap those if I need to. And then I plan a couple of the sessions in advance. And, and that's it all. That's all you really need. And so I don't ever have to throw out a huge chunk of anything because I haven't planned that. And so if they decide to join the Dark Lord, that's great. Let's join the Dark Lord, right? That's just very different. And so we'll take these plot points that were here at the end and we'll create some new plot points. And maybe this little character arc over here has changed just a little bit because now they're a little bit evil. Or maybe they have a little bit of a different plan because, well, their love interest is different, right? Whatever it might be, that's how it's gone. But I, I don't plan that far in advance more than plot points because then you're just scrapping huge amounts of information that you didn't need in the beginning. Yeah. I, I find what helps me a lot is making sure there are things that the players and therefore the characters care about. You know, if they have a family or a house that they need to take care of, if they are very invested for whatever reason in personal motivation, like a revenge or a something like that, because then no matter what they do, no matter what weird direction they decide to go in, there's still that thing they care a lot about. And that helps ground everything and it helps suggest more directions for the story and it, it kind of helps corral things. And it pops up later. Like, oh yeah, I will bring up that family. I will bring up that waitress that you did something <laughs> with however many towns back and now is knocking on your door you know, nine months later. Like, that will come up, let me tell you. I think, um, <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not the best at this personally. I think I'm only mediocre at it. But I think some of the best GMs I've ever played with um, 
have, they are students of life and they are students of stories, right? And so they do a lot what Natasha described, I think, right? They have plot points, they have ideas, right? Things where, places where the story can go, but then they react on the fly a lot to what the players want to do as it comes up. And that those have been some of some of the most interesting. One of there's, she mentioned Blades in the Dark earlier, and we have a GM that runs a Blades in the Dark game, and he told us the other day um, that he did. We asked him, you know, well, you know, you have to do a lot of preparation for all of this, right? He's like, I don't prepare. He doesn't prepare at all. He just comes to the game with understanding of what that world is and provides a hook here or a hook there, and if the players grab onto it, then fine, and if they don't, then fine, and he, something else comes up, right? Basically, your job boils down to asking yourself, what is the reasonable consequence of whatever your players are doing at any given moment? If they decide to go murder some merchant on the road, what's going to happen? Well, that his family is probably going to alert the authorities. The authorities are probably going to launch an investigation and that investigation may or may not fought, uh, lead back to your heroes. And if you, and then so your heroes are gonna have to deal with that, right? Now they got people knocking at their door asking questions. Where were you on the night of the such and such? And then if they kill those investigators, then what's the, rep, what's the consequence of that? Well, they're probably gonna get some big old Boba Fett bounty hunters to go hunt them down, right? Might even be, and, so, and you can create nemeses this way. I love what Natasha said about you know, the, you get these players that want to like sleep with every elven maiden they come across. Well, what's the consequence of doing that? That there are actually some really fun STDs in TMD. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Pete, there are books, there are resource materials you can get. It's actually really fun. But be very but, careful. But with by, <laughs> by providing reasonable consequences to your team, it it creates that sense of immersion because. You can't just do whatever you want and expect nothing to happen. So when they do heroic things, there should be heroic consequences. When they do villainous things, there should be villainous consequences. And by telling their own story, you morph the stage around them. And you create all of the, all, all, you create the second and third acts based on what they do in the first act. And that, it, that makes it really fun for them and it makes it really fun for you. because. I've had whole, whole uh, campaigns that were all villain-only campaigns, where all the players were villains. It was great, it was awesome. And the, the hero that finally struck them down and killed this horrible group, you know, there was this NPC, but that, that, was, this, that was the hero of their story, it's just we happened to be focusing on the, the dark lords that he killed. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, any modules that you guys would recommend, or, or resources, or things that, that might be helpful, and how you can modify these off-the-shelf things to make your game, to, to make them fit your table better, or to make it so your players don't know what's going to happen next. Any thoughts on that? I might, jump on, I might jump on a resource. So there's a book in the other room over here that you can purchase called XDM. It's written by um, Tracy, Hickman. Tracy Hickman and his, and his son, yeah. um, yeah. Curtis. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, XDM is a is a great resource for someone who doesn't have a lot of experience with game mastering. It's a good place. It's a good starting place with tons of ideas. It's very humorously written. It's it's fun. It's way more funny than I am. It might even be more funny than Aaron. Um, it's, it's pretty good. I would recommend it. Uh, I learned XDM is awesome. I learned most of what I know about DMing actually from <coughs> two different Rifts supplements. And Rifts has a bad reputation among a lot of role players because the rule system is so terrible. But they understand storytelling in a way that I think few companies do. And so the Rifts Adventure Guide and the Rifts Game Master Guide are basically just, you know, inch thick books with full of really, really good DMing advice. Uh, and I highly recommend those. And Palladium being what it is, you know, you'll also be buying this massive catalog of guns or whatever, but <laughs> <laughs> the GMing advice is the point. <laughs> Could you repeat those, please? Uh, the Rift Adventure Guide? 
Rifts R I F T S and Rifts Game Master Guide. And as far as that goes, Decipher's old Star Trek game, um, their Star Trek Narrator's Guide um, has such amazing storytelling advice that I actually did an entire YouTube presentation class on story structure just based on their tips from that book of how to put together a story and, and how to make something that will engage players. So the Star Trek Narrator's Guide is really fantastic as well. It's way out of print and hard to find, but. You guys are actually really lucky because there are way more resources now than there, there were before. And there, there, there are so, if you guys need maps, there are so many people who have put together maps of towns, castles, dungeons, uh, continents. That you, you can just go and print out everything you need in a matter of minutes. And a lot of the old modules are available for free online. Uh, two that I would suggest, they were made for D&D, but they'll work with any system, is these are classic ones. The Town of Hamlet and the Temple of the Serpent God. They're, these are classic Gary Gygax era uh, oh, mods. The, of... the Hamlet. And these are both excellent. They come with full maps. Every single house that they could possibly go into, it says exactly what they, is in that house, who lives there, what their names are, what they know, if they try to rob the place, where something might be for them to find. Just levels of detail that you'll never need, but that one time when they decide to rob the sheriff, they're like, well, how much money does the sheriff have hidden under the bed? Now you know. And there's also current stuff, like I cannot recommend enough The Curse of Strahd. I was just Strahd. about to recommend it. Yes, oh my gosh. Do, do you wanna, do you wanna uh, tell this one? I, I'm, I'm playing through this right now, so I'm not running this, but I am loving the experience of playing through. This comes with a full map that you pull out of the back and everything. This thing is so amazing, especially if you love gothic vampire stuff like I do. And the castle of Strahd's castle is easily the greatest dungeon that has ever been designed in any mod. It's huge, it's wonderful, it's thematic, it's beautiful. You can't go wrong with that. Totally. What was the name again? Curse of Strahd. If if you if you're going to get into D and D five E, that's a pretty solid one. For just quick hit ideas for worlds or campaigns or things like that, I would be I'm wearing the Gaunt Night Games T shirt. So Dan has written a couple of these. They are micro settings that are at the back of any tiny D six game. There are science fiction ones, there are fantasy ones, there are post-apocalyptic post -apocalyptic ones. Very soon there's going to be a superhero one. Um, and those are written by diverse authors with really cool ideas. So I like those a lot as a place to start an idea if you're just looking for something, right? Let's take a moment and talk about your basic kit that you're gonna want, okay? This, for those of you who don't know, this is called a shield. Put this down. In front of yourself is the DM for a couple of reasons. One, so that they can't see your notes because a lot of times you're sitting really close and if they see your notes, it can screw things up. Second is because sometimes you need to fudge the dice rolls and you don't want them to see you doing that. Not always. Now, I the, mean, the, 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 this is the official one and this has like all these awesome charts about going prone, go, going invisible. It has like price lists of things they can buy. This is a really, really good thing to have. And most, most importantly, it looks really cool. It does, it looks yeah. awesome. You can also have custom ones made, on, like on Etsy, which is fun. Second thing you're gonna want is, is a, a grid. Now this, you can, I just printed this out and laminated it, but you can get really nice ones. And some people like using miniatures. You don't really need to. You can just put little markers down and then just kind of draw out the terrain. Some people do theater of the mind where you don't grid everything out. Some people do. Uh, I find it's, it's the larger your group, the more important it is to grid it out because then it's like, wait, where's the ranger and where's the rogue? And there's 13 bad guys in this room. I don't have a good visual about where they are. The, if it's a small group, two or three people, you can get away with not having a grid, but the larger group you're going to want. 
And then of course you're going to want like, oh no, Demon's I put out the candle. Oh. Yeah, as I warned you at the beginning, when all the candles are out, everyone dies. So. <laughs> no. That's my song. Guard the candle. And then here's here's another one that's really big. I got this from like Barnes and Nobles. Tarot cards are so much fun. Like Curse of Strahd has this whole section where you go to this gypsy lady and she does like a tarot card reading and you can do all these thematic things with them. And, and it's so, they, these have a million and one uses and they're really, really fun to have. Little props like this really add to the thing. You can get puzzle boxes uh, online uh, those are really fun to actually physically give your players a puzzle to solve. Like there's a treasure in this box. Here, you have 30 seconds, you're not 30, you have three minutes to solve it. Turn over, turn over, like, and then start a timer. And if they don't solve it, then it disappears and you take it back. Little things like that can really, really add to the, the fun and immersion of it whenever they have anything physical to hold in their hands. One of the things that I use all the time, I actually never use grids. I don't like them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're wrong. Like he yeah. said, different people have different styles. I will always make sure that I have two or three different colors or styles of poker chip because I find them very helpful for some reason. Whether I need to use them as counters to show relative positions or I just need to give them out as currency or here, something awful just happened to you. Here's this chip. You can cash this in later for something cool. You know, just as little reminders of things. Uh, Tokens and chips are very valuable. Save your life. Or save somebody's life. <laughs> we're going to live. We're the GMs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> we always live. You can. Before we totally leave the, the discussion of really good modules, I have to. I cannot live with myself if I don't uh, praise the great Pendragon campaign, mm -hmm. um, which is Pendragon. We already mentioned earlier as a fantastic, it's an Arthurian game. One of the reasons that makes it so great is that your most useful attributes are not strength or agility or the physical stuff, it's all emotional and personality. Like, how chaste are you? How righteous are you? How valorous are you? How prideful are you? That's what really matters in an Arthurian setting. Uh, the Great Pendragon campaign is about twice as thick as the rulebook itself and covers all, what is it, 80 years of the Pendragon story, from Uther becomes king all the way up to the twilight of Camelot. Year by year, everything that happens, well, and it is so awesome. It is. Well, and what's different about this system is that each ses session is a year, yeah. right? So Whoa. this is not D&D where you sit down and you play a session and you're dealing with, you, you know. You through the fight before everyone has to go home. Exactly, right? <laughs> this is, you sit down and you play a year, right? So you might deal with like a scene and then a feast and like, right? And some like blip moments in your character's life in that year, right? But it's kind of just like, it's really cool. It's different. Yeah, and then at the end of each session, you will do um, the winter phase. So you will get married, you will have children. Eventually your character will be so old or will die in battle and you'll start playing as your son or your daughter instead. And it's- It's different. So cool. Anyway, yeah. Great Pendragon campaign is awesome. Yeah. Sorry, this would have been an interesting question. Most of the uh, sessions we did, because I had sessions again. Ah. Failed your speech roll. <laughs> yes, I did. I failed miserably in like the Moving on. With my group, I got, well, seeing as how one of my people is in England right now, we run the entire session online. Wow. Do you use Rule 20? Uh, no, actually, I use a Google Doc. <laughs> oh, so you're doing play by post. I'm bothered learning how to use Rule 20. Okay. Because that seems overly complicated. Anyway, you mentioned stuff for a kit earlier, and recommendations online, I do this sort of have a kit already available for. That's a great question. Roll twenty. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's really not that complicated. It's free. You just need to learn how to use the, use the tool. It's really worthwhile. It really is. I know it's, I, it might take you, you know, like 10, 20 hours to learn how to do it, but that time put into it is worth it if you're going to be using it to run campaigns. 
and you're doing that digitally, it's it's so worth it. Like I use it all the time as a pro, and 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 they have stuff that you can buy where they've already put in all the maps and all of the content for you, and you just buy that, and it's already put in, and they've already put in all the little monsters and all of the little stat blocks, and then you just click on the thing, and it's there, and then you can click on the little thing, and it rolls your dice for you, like. So yes, there is some learning how to use the platform, but at the same time, that that kind of eventually weighs out. So, and if you like the play by post platform and you want to keep doing that, I use Slack personally. Um, it's a different approach, but you can like thread out and um, you know, have different chat rooms so that you can hide things from different characters. And it's really cool because then you can have these like secret conversations between like three characters over here while these three characters over here are having this conversation. And then these characters don't know about this conversation these people just had. So I run some really cool intrigue campaigns that way. Um, so look into some different options. I mean, Google Docs works, but as far as a kit like this, um, it's all in Roll Twenty. It's just all there. Yeah, that's all. That's all in Roll Twenty. So I mean, it, as far as buying it, I mean, you can also just. I mean, at that point, you're just. I mean, that's also all, all online. I mean, there's no need at that point to be using it. You know. Uh, depending on the system you're using, there's a lot of good online resources as well. Um, yeah. uh, any Modiphius game will have a really good character generator online. Yeah. If you're doing D&D, &D, then D&D &D Beyond is a fantastic exactly. online resource that um, doesn't do all the stuff that Roll20 does, but it still is like a nice reference to have nearby while you're playing. And, and I was in the same boat you were before I used Roll20. I said, I don't want to use it, it looks complicated. I don't even play Dungeons and Dragons. But um, I had a group that had to go online and now we use Roll20 and the whole group learned it all together and it, it's really fairly quick. Yeah, and you learn, use the tutorials, use the forms. While we're talking about online resources, um, there are so many <coughs> random generators that all will be your ready. best friend. Yes. Um, <coughs> Especially for loot. Yeah, yes. There's just there's stuff that is specific to system. There's stuff that's just I need a name for this village. There's I need a really complex religion. Button click. Here's all of their beliefs. Religion um, Yeah, I use I use map generators all the time. Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, that, that, there's some that can do topography. There's some that do dungeon rooms. Uh, just and I don't even. It's not even worth giving you the names of them because if you just look up random dungeon generator, you'll find seven of them. <laughs> or, or if you have a map in your head, there are really great tools out there to make your own map yeah. too, yeah. right? There are some where you can, you can take the procedurally generated thing and, and work with it and change it to be what you want or there are like brushes for Photoshop that you yeah. can import and it'll put whatever mountain you want in that spot and whatever stream you want, I mean, you can, there's a lot of a lot of amazing tools to make your own stuff if you want to if you want to really roll your own. Yeah, that are free or close to free. Yeah, you've been you were raising your hand a while there. Um, okay, so I'm running a game for my group right now, and I'm running the game and I'm running the game Um, and we've been making do, but it's like hard for it to, I'm using like the back of wrapping paper, or um, like- That's a good hack. Yeah. It is great, yeah. <laughs> it works well. I never thought of that. I used to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and like our miniatures at the moment are just like little Pokemon figurines that have in my room. And like it's fun and it works, but I'm kind of worried that it's detracting from like Realism of the story because we're really, really big on role play and getting into character groups. Mm -hmm. Is there ways that you can, without, you know, yeah. completely ruining your life? Yeah, what, what you're talking about is how can I create more immersion without spending a lot of money? Yeah, 
right? Is there, like, times where you need your own supplies or ways that, or like places where you can buy some quality materials? Get a friend with a 3D printer. <laughs> <laughs> Make friends with a rich yeah. person. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there are some very cheap miniatures. If miniatures is something that you think will add to your game, Reaper bones are cheap as dirt. Um, especially if you can find someone who went big on the Kickstarters, I guarantee they've got two or three boxes they haven't even touched yet because there were so many. Um, and they just sell them in stores as well. If you or anyone you know is artistically inclined, it can actually be really helpful to buy, you know, a cheap set of art clay or even Play-Doh if you're adventurous, which it, it's not as good, but you can sculpt fairly good looking, you know, just figures or busts if you know what you're doing. There's a lot of tabletop war games, uh, the, like Warhammer 40,000, for example, and Warhammer Fantasy, where people will dump large amounts of their miniatures on uh, yeah. eBay just to get rid of them. And you can, so it, you know, if, if you're not too particular, you can pick up a lot of miniatures, usually unpainted uh, that way, and then paint them up yourself. You know, and you know, goblins and tyrannids look pretty much the same from a distance. So, <laughs> but I'm going to take you to the world of free. Find a picture you like, print it out, and put a little binder clip on it and stand it up. And that's what I do for yeah. most of my games. I don't really like minis. Um, I will buy a mini for the main characters, but for the little monsters, I. That just gets messy and it detracts personally. I'm gonna put these back. I like these. Um, they're the, like the fish tank tokens. You can buy like a bag of these for like what? I got them at the dollar a store. A buck. I just right? go, to the, go to any dollar store and you can find tons. And of so these are great for your monsters or even for your main characters if you really want to go cheap. Get a bunch of different colors, right? Your main characters are your green, your monsters are your blacks and your reds, and your... Do that. You separate the boss monsters and the minions. Yeah. Right, because you can get bigger ones. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and stick, if you want to stick with your wrapping paper, stick with your wrapping paper, but I think your battle maps can get down to like 20 bucks. You know, like if you really want to go that route, go that route, like on your birthday, splurge for a battle map and get your $20 battle map, right? Um, but yeah, I'm I'm not yeah. a mini fan, so I'm like you know spending two three bucks on a mini like for me is like. Yeah, what am I? Yeah, I, I like I said I don't use minis much. Uh, if you do want to use minis, um, we're actually about a month late for this. Every January, I will go to a craft store and pick up all the stuff that they got in for Christmas and couldn't unload. So like I was able to get a ton of pine trees with fake snow on them, just <laughs> cheap as dirt. Um, little like plastic roads that look like they're you know brick patterned or stone patterned, and they bought those so people could put them on their mantle at Christmas, and then nobody bought this one, and now it, they're just unloading it for for really cheap. Yeah. Also, aquarium, believe it or not, aquarium stuff makes for great terrain. Yeah, for your minis, like the, like the little, little broken castles, and yeah, I mean, you can, like like all those ruined towers and stuff for fish tanks. They look really good on a D&D table. <laughs> they can get a little more pricey though. It can, it can. I, I, I believe it or not, I don't think spending more money is the answer. I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If you want your players to be immersed, you need to make the players matter to the story, right? Every, every, every character that the, your players are playing needs to have a hook of some sort. You guys know what a hook is? Okay, it's like, I have this amulet from my father, I don't know what it means. Uh, I, I, my, my lover was stolen by a dragon, I'm trying to save her. It does not have to be complicated, it does not have to be particularly deep. But make sure everyone at the table has at least, preferably three, at least one hook built into their character and when you weave that into your story, you will make them go like this, right? Because they're, they're having an encounter, they're fighting a goblin chieftain, and they're going through his, lo his loot, and they find an amulet with the same symbol as the one your father had. <gasps> right? You've made them matter to the story. That's what creates immersion, not the miniatures. The fact that they're, 
They matter to the story. Because you're, 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 it's actually easier than writing a book. Because when you're writing a book, the, the reader, you have to make the reader want to care. But when you're at a gaming table, they want to care. They want to have fun. They want to be a part of this. So let them be what they want to be. Some people love being the turncoat. Some people love being the hero. Some people love being the, the, the you know, villain who becomes a hero. Whatever they want to be, let them be that and make them matter to the story, and they will be invested. In, in some ways, the way to add more realism to your game might be to just dial back on what you're using. Mm -hmm. yeah. Use the glass beads instead of the Pokemon figures, and then all of a sudden, imagination takes over. Yep. Mm -hmm. And they are more immersed, just because you're providing them with less details than more. And on another note, you said your group enjoys the role play, right? Maybe the system that you're playing isn't your system, right? Maybe try some other systems, right? Have you tried other systems? Maybe try some other systems. Yeah, the more the more modern, more story game style systems, like something powered by the apocalypse, or, or right, Blades in the Dark, yeah, a Blades or, in the Dark or, pack, or Fate, fate or something yeah, like that. That fate. doesn't <laughs> have doesn't have rules for minis. It doesn't have you know distances for combat or you know initiatives half the time, right? That's um, that can be a role play. Yeah. Games, right? Where it's all about character. And so maybe that might just be your group's thing. And, you know, so maybe try something different and just try a session or two, see if you like it. And if not, you can go back to your other thing. And that's fine. It's only four or eight hours. <laughs> no, maybe. No, I mean, it's not, right? In the, yeah, big, yeah. In the big scheme of things, it's not. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a break from what you've been doing. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you want more action, I can't, I, uh, one of my favorite systems I ever played was Big Eyes, Small Mouth, which is an anime role playing system. Yeah, yeah, it's it as awesome as it sounds. So cool. if, you, if you want to like, you know, let loose energy blast this split mountains, that is the system for you. If you want to defeat enemy armadas with the power of love, this is <laughs> awesome. Let me put in another plug here for the newest edition of Legend of the Five Rings. Uh, which is so heavily centered on uh, role playing and on emotion. I mean, yes, you're samurai, and yes, like you're combat masters, but how you comport yourself in public is so much more important. Yeah. Yeah. And they have a, a proprietary dice that they use, and that mechanic fits everything together so well that for a group that's really into role play, it's a beautiful, beautiful system. In the black yeah, shirt, yeah. Yeah. Um, so with my group, um, we have a kind of smaller version, so I had, um, none of us were super well experienced with DMing and the events of the group, um, and so I just had to know that I don't have a character that I want to pose. Is it possible to have a character in the DM, or should it be different? You gotta be careful. Every DM, it's every scary. DM has this dilemma, because it's so much more fun to play than to DM. DMing is like being the host. I disagree. Oh. I prefer to DM every single time. <laughs> no, it's, it's like being the host at a party. You're more interested in making sure everyone else has a good time. Every DM wants to be a character and a DM at the same time. I'm sure some of these He's people lying. agree, but in my opinion, it doesn't work. It never works. I, I do will... agree with the fact that it doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, I, my old D and D DM in college, he did it and he enjoyed it and it worked great. He could pull it off. I cannot. Um, I prefer to GM these days. I try. I've tried putting my own face character in, and it just never works for me. What almost always ends up happening is that character ends up becoming the DM's favorite character. <laughs> Right, and that's dangerous enough when it's one of the players. It's super right. dangerous when it's the DM. Either the character. favorite, or you're actively trying to not favor your own character, which right. means that they get forgotten yeah. and they're not involved in any of the storylines. And then why are they there? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah, I'll just echo all of that except for the fact that you can have fun both GMing and playing, and they are two very different experiences. Yes. How can you play with a really small group, two people? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. You mean like one on one? Yeah, one on one. Yep. Would you use a D and D system or would you make a different system? What would you use? How would you do well, you can do a bunch of different things. Um, a lot of systems would work for it. Go ahead. It's it's just about telling a story, right? So at any point in time, you are crafting a story for someone or for a bunch of characters, right? So when you create a story for a group, you have to spread that story throughout a bunch of characters. When you're just creating a story for a one-on-one -on -one session, you're just creating a story for that one person. So you need to be, instead of creating an overarching story that then you have these what, five adventurers, four adventurers, two adventurers, three adventurers, whatever, falling along in. And then they have their side stories. When it's just for one person, you're creating that story for just them, right? It is like a book with one protagonist rather than a book in which you follow five different protagonists or you have a cast of protagonists. Some of, some of my favorite um, adventures when I originally played, like in my early 20s, uh, was with a GM who ran Shadowrun for a group of four or five of us. And he would often take time to do solo mm -hmm. adventures with different people to take them to do something. And one of my favorite, and this is ridiculous, it's, it's just silly, but I was playing. I was playing an indigenous shaman, right, with like magical powers and power of the universe at his fingertips, and you know, oh, do all oh. yeah, right. And his grandmother would, without fail, show up with a glass of something really disgusting and make him drink it, right? And say, "Here, drink this." And one of the solo adventures was creating a company called Here Drink This, and creating this thing that we then sold to. To the world, and it became like the it became the company that all of my uh, characters worked, or not my characters, but all, everybody in the party worked for, and we at some point started to rival some of the mega corporations, and it was just it was just fun. It was I mean it's ridiculous, but it was fun. What you want to avoid is you want to avoid the the temptation to add in a lot of NPCs to flesh out that group. Uh, it, you, because having one person in the group, actually, you can make that a strength. One of the campaigns I'm running right now has just a single player. And it's actually really fun because it forces her to go about encounters in a completely different way. If there's a little orc encampment, she can't just charge in there, right? She's got she's to play the stealth game. She's got to lay traps. And it actually makes it a lot more fun because it's a different way of solving the problem. And so I would say don't don't give them like five NPCs and turn it into a standard group. Make it a strength, you know? It's actually really fun to be like, all right, I'm gonna design a castle that normally a six player group would have to infiltrate. But now you've only got one person to do it. How that how, how do you keep the battle system from quickly, you know, one monster can easily overcome a single person? That is your job as the DM or the GM to to work with, that is, that's your job, you right? Can advice on tactics, on as the GM, how to, and you can do to help with that? If you're doing D&D, they've got the level system already in place, right? Yeah. So the party has this many, you know, this many level X characters, then you know the level strength of the monsters that you can throw at them, and it's just lower. Well, also terrain factors in and weather factors in, right? When you design an encounter, you do not just say, here's my monster, that is your encounter. You design, you know, emotion, you design, here is your terrain we're fighting in, here's your platform, here is the number of enemies, here are your allies, here are... Right, there are so many other factors that you need to consider, so consider that. What are the things that you can give that single player that they can use to their advantage, right, that they need to think about? Maybe that monster went to a rager the night before and he's really hungover <laughs> and cannot function properly. Uh, but if you do that to every monster, it can get kind of old because every player... I mean, you've got to be creative. Like but, for one fight. Well, yeah, so that's... 
maybe there's maybe a they're chandelier drunk above them and they can fight. chop down. There we go. Exactly, <laughs> right? And that's <laughs> terrain. Or some explosive yeah. barrels nearby. Mm. Terrain. So here's, here, here's two more bits of advice for the person thing. Um, there, first of all, there are systems that can handle this better than others. Um, Star Trek Adventures by Modiphius is one of, one of my current favorites. It's amazing. They have a really good system already in place for filling out the rest of the crew, right? Because even in a group of four or five people, that's not even a full executive staff for a starship, let alone everybody. And so they've got the, a supporting character system in place that could potentially work with just one player who then is managing a, a larger cast. Uh, there are also, a, one of the modern kind of trends in role playing that you're seeing a lot of gives a lot of story control to the players. Something like Fiasco. Right, Fiasco works brilliantly with three. I've never played with two, but it might work there as well. Uh, something like Cold Shadows. Uh, something that gives the characters an opportunity, the players an opportunity to define a bunch of the story for themselves. And I've actually seen a really good hack, even just with D&D for this, uh, which is just called, it's basically a fail forward mechanic. Anytime they fail a roll, you give them a poker chip and say, okay, now you get to define something next time you act. Mm -hmm. And so on the next round, they're like, well, I have this chip, I can cash it in. Um, there's a thing nearby. There's a bench behind the monster and I'm gonna push him over. And so they are actively adding to the story instead of just reacting to what you're giving them. Yeah. They're able to define a big portion of what's actually going on. Have, have you ever played Breath of the Wild? Yes. Okay. That, is, that game, the way it's designed, that should be your model for designing encounters for a one-player campaign. Think of all the different ways that like Link can go about attacking an enemy base. He could wait till nightfall when they're asleep. He could go and cause an avalanche. He could get in a bit of a tree and snipe them from a long range. He can sort and board it with just pure skill. He could you know, make, throw a rock over there and distract them. He could set explosive barrels. He could start, light the whole thing on fire and attack them during the confusion. You need to design your encounters like that so that your player has a number of different options. That way, if they screw up and die, it's their fault for not really thinking it through and not your fault for giving them an impossible task. And here's my humble opinion. In any encounter, there should be a way not to fight. Mm, yes, yes. I'm gonna pull the audience again and I'll remember you have a question. Who here is having trouble finding a group? Who would like advice on finding a group? Uh, no, that's a good comment. You guys have any advice on finding a group? <laughs> everyone who has your hand up, look around at everyone else who has your hand up. <laughs> you are now a group. <laughs> Ta-da! We, we expect you to have your characters made by the end of the day. <laughs> uh, we don't want a GM. <laughs> She's your GM. <laughs> you can take turns. Hey, She's doing it pro bono. <laughs> <laughs> I do first session for you. There we go. Any thoughts on besides? No, I mean, that's a great question because finding a good group is the hardest part of the game. Not going to lie. A good group will it'll always be a fun experience. A bad group, it'll always be crappy. It's such a contextual thing. And when you get a bad group, you have to decide yeah. is it worth the pain? Kicking out that one guy who's causing all the problems, or is it worth changing the game so that everybody enjoys it? Or are you that one guy and should you leave? I know. <laughs> and you back out. Yes, you should leave. But and if you have three people that want to role play and one person that just wants to XP grind, but I'm weak. how do you resolve that? You know, but back, when, back when we played, again, in college, um, Brandon Sanderson is, is one of my old, oldest friends, and uh, we used to always play together, and his younger brother would always be the problem child of the group. Right? And he's only like two years younger than I am, but <laughs> still, he was the little brother. And what we realized, and this was the GM being very smart, is he gave him a secret, and then he was fine. Mm -hmm. He would stop stealing from the party, he would stop causing problems, because he already had his secret. He was already different and unique and special, and he, <laughs> the secret didn't have to matter. It could eventually come out, or it could not. But the GM, you know, figured out, what's that one guy doing? What's gonna fix this? Okay, I'm just gonna give him a secret that only he knows, and then he was fine. And so, paying attention can help fix a group before you get to the point of jettisoning a problem place. Storm 
Sometimes. Sometimes to, you just have to jettison the problem. To come back to the to the um, idea of where do you find a group other than obviously there are some of you in here that obviously should be playing together, right? But um, <laughs> there uh, there are some other options as well, and I talked about a few of these in the in the creating a welcoming game community uh, panel. Which was an excellent panel. Yeah, it was a great panel. Um, not because of me, but it was a great panel. <laughs> anyway, so there are some options there um, at school. There can be you know boards where you can put up that you want to have a group, or there may already be groups meeting. There may be clubs, right? Um, at the workplace, there may be clubs. Like my company sponsors an RPG club, a board game club, and a um, Magic the Gathering Club, and they give all of them budgets, so you get swag for joining the group. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I'll come back. I'll come back to that. Anyway, uh, otherwise, you can you can look on Meetup.com. There are, there are groups forming on Meetup.com. Uh, you can look on Discord. There there are groups communities of gamers in Utah or wherever you live, most likely. Uh, forming in those places, right? So look online, and just because you're going to meet and play in person doesn't mean you can't use online as a resource to find people to play with. Really, just look for the kind of people you would want to hang out with, right? Like you're going to laugh at me, but my favorite group I ever played in was made by guys from my elders' corps, because we were already friends, and just one day we were like, you know what, we should play D and D, and like, you know what, I've never done that, I've done that, and it was done. And, Find people that you enjoy being with, and it'll be a great time. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to plug recruiting your friends, right? You guys already have the hardest part done. You found the, the GM. Now you just got to convince your friends to play in your game. It's true. I'm going to say a couple of things. One, recruiting your friends does not always work. Okay, sometimes you are good friends, and that is great. Sometimes D&D is not their thing, or sometimes D&D causes problems when you hit the table. Okay, sometimes it does not always work. Two, going to a board game store and finding people there can be good, okay? Don't shy away from that. Not everyone at a local game store is the people that you wanna play with, that's fine. But going there and meeting some people is okay, then you fly off to your own homes and take the people with you that you want, right? A lot of places have game nights. Yeah. That's a really good resource. Um, the other thing that I want to say is do not start off with planning a campaign. Start off by playing one shots or short engagements that are going to last like two or three sessions, okay? And you want to do this because the group that you start playing with might not click. Right, or you might have a problem player or someone that you hate, okay, and that's okay. Or well, they might hate you. Right, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you want to be able to say, hey, this isn't working for me, or hey, I really like you, but I don't like you. And be able to step away nicely and politely in a nice, social, socially not mean way, like I just, Phrased it. I get the hint, Natasha. <laughs> <laughs> He's in my gaming group. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, and so keep those those first interactions short, and then build up to a campaign. That's a lot. That's a big problem that I see is people jump in wholehearted, thinking this is going to be the best group ever, and then they are disappointed with one or two people in the group, but feel socially obligated to finish out that game, which could have potentially been planned for two years. And I know, I know a lot of you are really non-confrontational. I am too, I get that. But here's a really easy exit route. If you have a situation where like three of you are really clicking and then like one or two of the other people are just not, finish the campaign quickly. And then once it's done, form a new group with the people you that way you don't have to kick anyone out, but you are kicking them out. That's why I'm saying plan short. Yeah. Plan short in the first place. Okay, so I have a question for Natasha, and this might not apply to the rest of you. So, thank you for listening in. Everyone heads down. <laughs> <laughs> just just between you, the two of them. How so do you, as a professional GM, 
How do you handle that when one of the people you want to kick out is paying you to do this in the first place? Um, it depends on why I'm wanting to kick them out. So do you have a particular no. reason? No, I'm just curious. This, this fascinates me. Do you have many, many reasons to want to kick people out? We had the problem well, sure. child. We need to get rid of them. Sure. But he wasn't paying me to do it. Well, so, so but, but the, that to me is not a problem. Okay. Right, that to me is a... Hey, you're causing some mischief in the group, but there's a, there's a solution to that, right? And a good GM can fix that. Yeah. Right? To me, a problem player is you are intentionally causing issues in the group. You are intentionally derailing the campaign. You are being rude to other players. You are making fun of other players. You are harassing other players. Like, those are reasons to kick someone out. And at that point, you've got all the receipts and you can go ahead and just do it. Sure. Or talk to the rest of the players and say, uh, Jack is kind of a jerk. Well, no, I don't even have to talk to them. I just kick them out because okay. it, it's my company. It's I'm a pro, <laughs> right? I'm running this shindig. And but does that become a problem if it's like a group of, we used to play D&D in high school and now we're old professional guys and we can't DM our own game and you just kicked our friend out. What's your friend? Okay, <laughs> show of hands. If someone is causing you an issue in the group, they are harassing you, they are derailing the campaign, do you want them in your group? If, sh raise your hand if you want them in your group. Is the hand over here? Yes, <laughs> you want them in your group, raise your hand. Okay. Right, so I kick them out. Because no one wants them in the group. Nice. It's that easy. We had a question over here first. What would you tell a new GM about handling sensitive inadequacies if you were Tell your players you're new? Yeah. And that's it. Be, be up front. Be up front with them. And, and get patient players, right? If you can get players who have GM'd, that's a good way to go, right? Um, because they will they will, without fail, be patient with you because they understand, right, that they'll have empathy for your situation. We've all been there. If you're in a group where you're already playing, see if you can DM a, GM a couple sessions, right. and everyone will know that it's your first time. Right. And you're already familiar with all this. We had a question up here. You had your hand raised, right? Yep. Um, I just wanted to talk about um, like someone in the group that you don't like who is causing an issue. I actually had to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And there was someone who was constantly breaking rules and causing a lot of issues. And it's just, you know, there's a point where you have to deal with that and kick them out because they're causing issues for everyone to get out of the group. This, this is something that we talked about in the creating a good wargaming community, but there are, and it applies here too, there are about 5% of the players that are just monsters. They're, they're, their fun is ruining other people's fun. Yeah. And they will never change, and it doesn't matter how many times you're patient with them, and it doesn't matter how many warnings you give them, they will never stop doing it. And for people like that, you cannot reform them. You can only, it's like a cancerous tumor. You just have to pluck it out and throw it away before it infects the host and hurts them. In our board game group, we call that JD Ooh, a particular person. A guy named JD. No way! Oh, he became an adverb! He, he was a verb. Someone just JD'd the game. <laughs> I know a guy named JD. He was a jerk too. When, <laughs> what is it about JDs? When you start a group, come in, lay ground rules. Yeah. Okay, so as a GM, as a professional GM, I have some ground rules. We play PG 13 games. We don't play evil characters. And for my D&D games, we use Wizards of the Coast published source material only. Okay? And those are my ground rules. If those ground rules get broken, you break them once, we talk. You break them twice, we talk, and I get pretty firm about it. You break them three times, you're probably getting booted. Right? Sorry. 
And, and so that, that's pretty much how it goes. If you're dealing with something like this on a Discord group, it's pretty much the same thing, right? You set those ground rules as soon as you set up your Discord group, and, and it gets really easy to handle put, that. Put them in your welcome Just, channel, pin it. Yeah, we, yeah, we kind of like the whole like rules. Yeah. Yep. Have you guys ever heard of the concept of a session zero? Mm -hmm. The session zero is the session you have before your first session. And it's actually really important. It's not only when you make your characters, it's when you set the tone for the whole campaign. It's when you as a DM sit down, like Tosh said, and you say, this is the kind of DM, this is what I expect out of you guys. This is what you guys expect out of me. What kind of campaign do you guys want to run? How do you want this to be rules heavy, rules light? Do you want this to be Monty Python, or do you want this to be Lord of the Rings, right? The session zero is really important. You shouldn't skip that. And one of the things that I, that I always uh, tell my players when, when I'm doing the session zero is I, is I tell them, this, this, is, this is what I have planned out. This is, these are my expectations for you guys. And I always tell them, I expect you guys to do your homework. If you're gonna go into the bad guy's castle, I expect you to do a little reconnaissance first. Talk to the people in town. Maybe send, send a familiar in there. Get the lay of the traps, get the lay of the land. I expect you, because if you just run in there, I'm not gonna change the traps for you. And you're gonna get yourselves killed. And I tell them that from the beginning. And so that way, if they stumble onto something and they didn't do their due diligence, then they have no one to blame but themselves, right? The guy, the guy at the well knew about the sand trap. You guys just thought it'd be more fun to rush in and kick the door down. And that's just me. Every DM has their style, but it's important to have that session zero and to tell them, this is what I expect out of you guys. Because that social contract is, is, can, creates the framework in which all the jungle gym of fun occurs. Mm -hmm. well, and I, I've seen four hands, but go ahead if you have anything to say. I will say sometimes I don't do a session zero but I do speak to each of the players individually, right? And so you don't have to sit down and have a big session zero at your table with everyone sitting there all at the same time, right? And sometimes that's very popular, but I do it individually. Yeah. Or if it's a group you've already played with, you yeah. can skip it. Do you do this online or analog? Both. All right, so yeah, green shirt against the wall. Here's the first one I saw, and then did you have a question? And then we'll do you in the jacket here, and then you've got a question again. <clears throat> what are your thoughts on magic dragons? I once tried to do a campaign about magic dragons. There were no spell casters in the party. Everyone got to walk into the next campaign. I tried out magic dragons. I accidentally overdid it. Everybody got slaughtered by the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm noticing a theme in your campaigns. <laughs> so what are our thoughts about magic items? Yes. Well, you know, the, the thing, you have so much control over what they're facing. You know, you, the, you can always make what they're encountering more difficult or less difficult. You know, you can, if, they're, if, if the monster they're fighting, if, if they're just not up to the task, you can make this an adolescent one and just cut its HP in half. Or an ancient one and double its HP. You have so much control over the difficulty level. I mean, that difficulty knob is yours to toy with as much or as little as you want. So magic items, to me, is a non-issue. If the party's really powerful, that's cool. Just have them fight against really powerful things. If they're really underpowered, that's fine too. Just have them fight against really lower power things. The only question is, are they fighting things that are a reasonable challenge for them so that it's not a cakewalk and so they're not getting slaughtered? It, it's like playing a, a, an MMO online where everything you fight is more or less essentially the same amount of challenging, depending on, because if you're tougher, then the monster's tougher, and if you're weaker, the monster's weaker. And the only difference is, we beat this monster with an old beat up sword, or we beat this monster with a super awesome sword, and I can fly, and I can turn into a tiger, you know? <laughs> um, and so if you want to have the things that magic items can add to a game, then throw them in, and if not, then don't. Like, it's, it's all up to you as the GM. You're fully in control of everything. Uh, I'd say 
one other thing for that is that as a, I mean, and you, I heard you mumble about oh, this in the not. background, so I'm probably still in your thunder, but um, like, if your players want to die, then, you know, give them a game where they die. Right? I mean, we. No, I, I, I'm not even awesome. kidding, right? That I mean, could be awesome, heroic can. sacrifice. I mean, that's a great right, story. Right, right. Um, <laughs> or if you just want to play an old school revival style game, I mean, I played one like this a couple of years ago where, you know, we went into a dungeon as a party and, and we, I mean, there were like 15 deaths in the space of two and a half hours, right? And you're like, roll a new character, roll a new character, and keep playing, and everything was killing us, right? And that was. For whatever reason, that was what we wanted to do, uh, and I wasn't the GM of that game. But, but um, you ultimately, I sometimes hear who's heard the word, the term um, total party kill, total party TPK, total party kill. Okay, so I've heard people say, oh yeah, we we had a TPK. No, we didn't have a TPK. Your GM had a TPK, right? The GM has control. The GM always has control. If there's a TPK. That is your decision, right? So if you don't, if your group doesn't want to have a TPK, I would suggest trying to avoid that. The thing to always remember is let your players have their fun. If you have someone who's created this kick butt archer with a super good rules combination that just lets them do tons of damage, don't constantly be putting them in encounters where it's raining and they can't shoot their foe. It's just going to ruin their fun. You know, it, you can do that occasionally, right? But the point is, if they want to be the super, if they want to be Legolas and just be the Archer of Death, let them be the Archer of Death. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen DMs that are constantly trying to throttle back their players. If they want to be the super, you know, mind-controlling warlock, let them mind-control the bad guys. Don't make every encounter, oh, this is immune to mind control. This is immune to mind control. Let them have their fun. Okay? Don't be like, no, no, it, it, it's too easy for you guys. Well, if it's too easy for them, then you're just not being creative. Here's the easiest thing in the world. If, if they're having too easy of a time, double the number of monsters they're fighting in any given encounter. It'll get harder, I promise. <laughs> we did an entire campaign once where uh, the, the whole second act was on the continent that was all undead and construct. <coughs> which in theory sounds cool, but in practice, the rogue couldn't use his crit strike whatever on any monster we faced for about six months of playtime. Which is not fun And it was him. not fun yeah. for him at all. It was awful. Can we come over? I, I've had, I've had, a, I, a long time I had a campaign, my player was all about high charisma, negotiation, diplomacy, and it was a five months of dungeon crawl. And I, and I was just like, I was like, why am I even playing this character? It, it, yeah, it was, it was total wash. Your question? Okay, so my husband and I have a couple of groups. Well, we have one main group that we're playing with, and um, we kind of had some things like that, not just kind of a little bit of a flop. And so I'm wondering if you would recommend um, going and finding someone who's a really seasoned GM or DM, and going and just playing the one shot with them to mm -hmm. kind of see like how good it can be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but or would you recommend against that because you don't want to see no, <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't. That's like I mean, saying you should only date losers. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, watch, yeah, absolutely. Find, find somebody to emulate, right? You can do that by going and playing a game with another group. You can do it by watching actual plays online, right? There's all sorts, oh, yeah. of, there's, all sorts of options. There's so many resources on YouTube. There's thousands of hours of how to be a good game master, how to be a good player, how to make good encounters. There are so many resources out there. You can go on YouTube and find professional level you know, <laughs> uh, dissertations about how to create a campaign from start to finish. I mean, like scholarly, some of these, I mean, these are real nerds, scholarly <laughs> papers and stuff. Uh, so it, the, the resources are out there. Just go take advantage of them. Or you can hire someone like me. I will take a moment and just plug myself. But OK, there's seriously a reason why I have a job. Right? And I, I charge about what it takes to go see a movie. Right? Which is, which is reasonable. Right? So if each of your players pay what it takes to go see a movie, 
I come in, I sit down, we play a session, we play a couple of sessions, and then at the end you can ask me what I did and why I did it, and you know, and and then you figure out some stuff that you can take and do it. Some of the movies, like we want to go have some raw experience, but like you don't have to like. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing it. I mean, that's what she's offering, right? Is I will come, I will show you exactly how to do this, and then you can yep. take over from there yeah. once you stop paying her. <laughs> if, if, if that's what you want, right? Some people don't want that. Some people want a GM that's going to be there for a while because they enjoy that experience and they want a seasoned story, storyteller who's going to be there from beginning to end. But part of some people want to learn how to GM, and I do that as well. I'll, I'll warn you, she is really good and you won't want to fire her. <laughs> it's not firing, it's just failing to renew the contract. <laughs> We're, we're, good. We're, we're not picking up your contract. We're taking the company in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> You're part of an outplacement. <laughs> yeah, that's just what so, said to you. Let's come up here, and then he's in the queue, and I'm going to put you in the queue. Anybody else want in the queue? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not got a work moderator. Gotcha. All right, I'll try to remember everybody, but you're up. All right, so question Depends. I always do it in session zero. I will occasionally do extra stuff over email beforehand, individually, but I like doing a session zero, let's all make our characters together, because that helps make sure that the characters are in some way interlaced, rather than, here's a bunch of strangers. Right. And I'm a big believer in the session zero, because that's when you're gonna come up with your hooks. Right? You need, the player and the DM both need to be somewhat excited about the hook for that character. And so it, it, being there one-on-one -on -one is, is a really good way, because when both of you go, oh yeah, that's a good idea, when you have that zing moment, then you know, okay, this, we, we got it here. So I, I think the session zero is the best place to make the characters. And you don't even have to do that all at once. You can just individually with the people get it, get it done at some point before your first session. Yeah. Before session zero, I will field emails to make sure that they know what they're going to be able to do and not, so that we don't get to session zero and I have to shut them down there. And all of your characters, like you said, need a, a general reason to be working together, right? So if you've got like three people who are professional assassins, and then this guy who's a, who's an archaeologist, <laughs> right? I want to play Indiana Jones, and there's a, right? <laughs> see, see, you can make that work, but you do have to put a little thought into it because there's always that one guy who wants to be, I want to be the Fonz, and hey, you know. <laughs> And, you know, sometimes the font sticks out like a sore thumb. <laughs> but like you, like you pointed out, it can work. But that's why it's important to do the session zero so that there's a reason why your party is together. Did anyone want to advocate the not, the just bring the characters? Devil's advocate? No. Yes. I'll, yeah, I'll okay. do it. Uh, so if you're playing, if you're playing a one shot, okay. right? Yeah. Maybe you don't have time for a session zero. Maybe you just have people who already know how to play this game and they make their characters and they bring them and you put them into a specific scenario, right? There, there, I think there are a few cases where it makes sense. Or if you're playing that, if you're playing that game where everyone's gonna be dead in five minutes anyway, right? And they'll be rolling new characters, then no, right? But, I mean, but usually yes. That's the uh, that's the basis of like adventure league and Pathfinder society and all of that. The thing that that kind of can take out a little bit is your character development and all of that, right? So you as a role player have to be really committed to bringing in a character. But if you want to have the best game, <coughs> session zero. Yeah. Okay.
It's a good question, and the answer is not necessarily directed at you is the problem, because uh, it is your friends who are taking offense and not you. Um, what I have done in the past is uh, just try to find the time to run both groups. You like those people. You want to hang out with those people. Let's do the goof game with them, and let's do a serious game with somebody else. Um, I assume that you, when you decided to form the more serious group, that you talked to the other people and said, hey, we're gonna form this serious group. Um, this is how we're gonna do it. This is why we're gonna do it. Um, and if you wanna be a part of it, then that's awesome, let's do this. If you didn't do that, then there's obviously other reasons that you didn't want them in the more serious group. And so it's not entirely unexpected that this is causing a problem. Um, I will say that, you guys know Paul Jeunesse? Another author who does a lot of stuff here. He's such an awesome guy. Uh, he was in the big, huge two-year L5R campaign that I ran uh, a while ago. And we had already done, we'd already been going for several months before he joined the group. And we were the goofy Monty Python group. And we would crack jokes all the time, we would do everything. And then he showed up for the first session. He was a, uh, he was a, a monk. And the group got attacked in the middle of the night. They were traveling through a mountain pass and they got attacked by bandits. And so I'm going through, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you? We got to his point in the initiative. What are you doing? And he's like, I'm putting on my war paint. And well, the whole reaction, yeah, the whole action. Okay. We go around, everyone else is fighting. <laughs> he's still in his tent. We get back to him. What are you doing? I'm saying a prayer over my Tetsubo <laughs> so that it will defeat these bandits. And just by his, the way he was playing this, it sounds funny because I'm telling the story to be funny, but he added gravitas that we didn't already have. His character was taking this fight and the culture they were in seriously, and the whole group kind of was like, oh, we can do that too. And it changed the whole flavor of it. And so I think that there's a lot of room to fold some of those good friends into the more serious group. And once they see what you're going for, they'll be like, oh, okay, I totally get this. You're right. This is a lot of fun. Let's go for it. The problem is that we pulled in, like, we did a campaign, my friend and I did for this group, where we made it more serious. We're like, hey, this is actually a serious thing that you guys can do. And then you purposely kind of took it and made it a joke. I'm going to be mean. Okay, and you're gonna have to be, and you're gonna have to bear with me while I be mean. Okay, there's when I come to this, there's something else that's going on here. Your friends aren't, and maybe I'm not being mean when I say this. Your friends aren't upset that you're going off and doing your own thing. I mean, that's actually what they're upset at. They're they're upset that you're not spending time with them, right? They they want to spend time with you. So find something to spend time with them doing, right? It might, it might not be playing RPGs, right? It might be doing something else. Maybe that's not the thing that you're supposed to be doing together, right? Like I said earlier, friends don't always make the best RPG group, right? And that's okay. And you have to be able to say that to your friends hey, I'm looking for something different in an RPG group, and they have to be able to accept that. And if they can't, what do you think I'm gonna say? <laughs> They're not very good friends, okay? So that's my little bit of meanness coming out, <laughs> but that, that's, go spend time with them elsewhere or, and have that honest conversation with them, you know? Like, hey, this isn't my type of, this isn't my type of RPG game. I want something more serious. You guys don't take the RPG game serious. Let's spend time doing something else together. Very good advice. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah. <laughs> so you're up next in the back. <laughs>
the mistakes that most uh, DMs make is they forget how cowardly most monsters are. Right? Like, bandits are cowards. They, they want to steal and get away. Very, very few things that you're going to be fighting are going to fight to the bitter end. Most things, the second they start, the second the writing is on the wall, and they're like, oh crap, we're gonna lose? They're gonna start running and fleeing. They don't wanna die for, this isn't the hill they wanna die on. Most DMs don't do that. Every monster, almost without fail, fights until it runs out of hit points, and then the encounter's over. Uh, the way I do it is I look at it realistically. If this is like a religious zealotist group, yeah, they're gonna fight to, to the death. But if this is just like a group of you know mountain bandits, the second they realize, oh crap, these guys are way stronger than we thought, they're gonna start running. And then it becomes this fun, either let them go, or this fun pursuit battle. Running battles can be really fun, because then you can turn that into a tactical retreat. Some of the players get overextended, right? Then the three of the bandits rally, set a trap, and now this person is out ahead of the group by themselves. That's the opposite of a fizzle. That's now you've made it from a, lo a winning situation into a critical situation. Always be thinking, would they really continue this fight, or would they run, or surrender? Do you mean a nat one on the monster side, or on your player side? Oh, on the player side. Okay. So here's the thing. If you look at it from a story perspective, your heroes need to fail, right? Your heroes cannot be heroes without failure. And I, I think sometimes we as DMs like to think, hey, let's just have the heroes always win. Not, not my players. But then, <laughs> they, they fail no matter what I do. They don't feel. <laughs> <laughs> they do. That's also wrong. That's, that's also wrong. But then they don't feel like heroes, right? So if they get that nat one, roll with that nat one. Right? Lean into that nat one. Don't let it fizzle, right? Make that situation worse. Yes. Yep. Tell, tell them the monsters saw their failure in fights with renewed vigor. Yeah. Have, have add, more bad guys show up. Add drama. <laughs> right? Earlier when I talked about uh, different methods of giving the players more story control, that's one that I do in every game I run. If there is a way to critically fail, I always have the players describe their own critical failure. More fail it's forward. not just that you missed. What does critical failure look like? And then they're forced to go, oh, crap, well maybe I dropped my sword, or maybe this other thing happened. And it starts to get really interesting, and they are more invested in it, and suddenly it's a story and not just a bad role. I have a story that I will share, and this is a Nat One story. I had a bad guy. A bad guy that everyone hated in the group because he was a slimy slaver, right? But he had strapped a baby kobold, right? No one really likes kobolds to begin with, but this was a baby kobold, okay? He had strapped one to his chest. Like a baby Bjorn? <laughs> no, like just strapped him to his chest because the kobolds were gonna listen to him because they ha he had their baby. Okay. Now, who was shooting at the bad guy? The good guys. <laughs> right? Now, what happens when they get a nat one? They still hit. They still do damage, but what do they shoot? The baby kobold. Now, I still, now I still have an archer running around feeling awful about this baby kobold that he has shot. He's going to the therapy. Shooting in the first place. Right? But this is character development that has happened because of a nat one. Because of a nat one. Mm -hmm. Right? So <coughs> use those nat ones. And it doesn't have to be to do more damage, right? That's a critical failure, but that's a story critical failure. Yeah. And that archer is never again shooting at anyone standing anywhere near an innocent for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> Even though that innocent was considered evil. 
Anytime you can add narrative drama on the positive or the negative side, I would say that is almost never a bad thing, right? Um, I, we've talked about Pendragon a couple of times. The feast part of Pendragon, so much drama can happen mm -hmm. in that feast, right? I've had entire character arcs start out of a feast where somebody just accidentally spilled a drink on someone, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's legit. Yeah. yeah, Pendragon often ends up as, what's the thing we have to kill before we're allowed to go to the feast? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got about 10 minutes. Question number four left, but I think there was a question here. Um, so my, my question is, I just started writing an entire campaign. I have a rogue. He started out a paid out he's kind of a neutral, and he wants to have a lot of good reasons to do his rogues. Um, I don't feel like a lot of good is going to fit with the group at all. Most of them are either counter neutrals or neutral allies. You have one that's a lawful evil as well. And so, um, how do you convince a player that it's his idea and that his character shouldn't be what he wants it to be? <laughs> well, see, to me that's not a conflict because there's lots of ways to play lawful good, right? There, there's the classic paladin kind of, you know, wet blanket who's constantly wagging his finger at the rest of the party. You know, we shouldn't do well, that. That's, that's but you don't mean. have to play lawful good that way. Lawful good can be an exemplar. Lawful good can be, I know that the people in my party are doing things that are wrong, but I'm going to show them the right way. Okay. Right, you can play it that way, and then it doesn't destroy the group cohesion. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't, to me, that's not a problem. Just, you, they just have to play lawful good as, you know, I'm, I'm the paragon, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm not going to stop the rest of my party because I respect their agency, that's part of my, you know, whatever. The, the, I would do it that way. Okay. Then know, it's a non issue. You, you can also sit down with that player and say, hey, you realize your character arc, once completed, is going to put you at odds with the rest of the group. How do you want to handle that? Ooh, player, do yes. you want to retire yeah. this guy yeah. who decides to move on to bigger and better things and then you'll roll a new character? That's a really cool ending for a character. Yeah. Yeah. And then that can become an NPC that we come back to later who potentially is even fighting against the party. Let, you know, give the player some options. Here's all the different ways that we can complete the character arc you want to go for. Do you want to stick around and, and be the missionary who tries to help them? Do you want to retire and move on? And then see what the player wants to do. Well, one of the best character hooks there is, is what is my exit from the stage? Now, so many people play their characters, oh, I'm going to play this character forever. But some of my favorite characters are the characters where I'm from the start, I was like, this character is trying to redeem himself for past sins. And, when, and I want him to die eventually, but I want him to die gloriously in a way that will save lots of people. And that is the end of his story. Good character hooks have an end to their story. And don't be afraid to have a character who's essentially doomed. Because those are fun stories too. Natasha. Your character arc is not necessarily level 1 through 20 or whatever your system is, right? And so either it's up to you as the GM to say, hey, his lawful good happens at level 20. Right, or whenever your campaign ends. Or it's up to you to say, hey, maybe, you know, your character ends <coughs> here, and so what do you want to do? Right. And for anyone who wants to play a good character and doesn't want to be the Western mm -hmm. Paladin, I recommend Rick Stump's article, Good is Not Weak, Stupid, or Nice. It's all about how to play a good character who can be a jerk. You maybe interact with some of those evil characters a little better. There was a diagonal line. Rick Stump, his blog post is dumb. his blog is Don't Split the Party, as good as not, weak, stupid, or nice. There was a diagonal line here, so somebody in this area had a question. Way back wall. All right. Do you guys use music when you do your lessons, and then what app do you guys use for it? Sometimes. There, there are some great YouTube compilations that are already set to go. Uh, so if you want Celtic music, there's like three, four hours of traveling music, battle music, 
uh, you know, political intrigue music. Just do a little search, get like a, I have a playlist. But do you really switch fun. between them for the different situations? So when you go into battle and do you just have like the multiple tabs open then? Or how do you do it? Okay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just, when they finish the diplomacy music, I piece in, they start the fight, they get to that, and I start the next one. All right, here we go. Yeah. One, of my, and one of my favorite tracks is actually from The Matrix. You know that? Do, 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 do. That's a great climax song. We're just like, it's time to fight the big bad. We've been leading up to this for four, four sessions. Here we go. Your fear table will respond. Yeah, use music. It's, um, it's amazing. We, we had a GM who played the Captain Kirk fight music anytime. <laughs> that didn't really add to the
<laughs> what finally worked for my kids was actually Margaret Weiss's Marvel superheroes. Uh, because they didn't, as brand new role players, know how to be an imaginary person that they had never met, but they did know how to be Wolverine. And so they bridged a gap that got them into it, and now, of course, they're much more experienced. But something like that works well. For, for my little family, that's great Westerns, right? I mean, everybody knows yeah. how Mark's work, right? So it's a great game. Doesn't yeah. matter what system we're playing, my three year old my role model, they can't play <laughs> PJ Maxx, find, find a simple system like uh, Hero Kids or Tiny Dungeons or something like that that's really easy and then let them build on that. And don't tell them what they're supposed to do because they will rebel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 